Okay, here we are for our first video on the peripheral nervous system. So this is going to be the first of one of our more challenging units historically. And what we're going to do in these first few videos is to try to kind of take a deep dive into a review um, and a pretty thorough understanding of the autonomic nervous system or the peripheral nervous system and most specifically the autonomic nervous system. So the reason why we talk about this subject, which is oftentimes referred to as neuropharmacology, is because, um, if you recall, we have two ways to really communicate over a distance in our body, one of which is the nervous system and the other of which is the endocrine system. And um, there's a whole bunch of conditions that are going to be treated either directly with autonomic nervous system drugs or they're gonna have autonomic nervous system side effects. And so we have to have a really good understanding of this setup in order for us to really get our firm grasp on pharmacology and ultimately how to approach clinical conditions using medications. So that's the goal of this particular chapter, the first few videos, and I'm not sure how many, I'm gonna to try to keep them kind of short um, but the first few are going to be a review of the autonomic nervous system, um, specifically autonomic physiology, and then we're going to move into um, the drugs later on down the way. So here's our learning objectives. So we're going to be sure by the end of these first introductory videos that we can differentiate clearly between the voluntary and the involuntary um, divisions of the autonomic nervous system. We're going to be pretty clear on sympathetic and parasympathetic responses at specific body organs and how that looks. And we're going to be really clear on the neurotransmitters released at both the voluntary nerve endings and the preganglionic and postganglionic nerve endings of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems. So that's where we're starting. And then we'll continue on and ultimately get into the drugs of these systems in a little bit. So just a quick review of our basic function of the nervous system. So like I said, this is our distance communicator and really what the nervous system is responsible for doing is it's responsible for monitoring both the internal and external environment of the body and then letting the brain know of what's going on, right? It's a lot of integration here. So there's a lot of interplay between the periphery and the central nervous system, um, both sensory going towards the brain and motor leaving the brain and going towards our targets. So what the nervous system is responsible for doing is both processing and integrating these changes that are happening um, in most cases peripherally and then figuring out what to do about them, right? So what the, what the appropriate response would be. And essentially what the response is gonna do is it's going to then elicit um, some kind of action at a target. So the uh, central nervous system's job is to respond to the changes that are happening, you know, once they're alerted of them, and then designing some or divining some sort of action that will be communicated ultimately at the target. And so what the autonomic nervous system specifically is looking at, and I should say, I should say the efferent division of the nervous system, both autonomic and voluntary, what what we're looking at ultimately is what's happening at the target, right? That's that's the goal. And so when we start to talk about the drugs, that's ultimately what the objective is in most cases. But before we can do that, we really have to sort of dial in on what this setup is all about. So as I'm sure you all know, we have two divisions of the nervous system, one being central and the other being peripheral. The central nervous system is composed of the brain and the spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system are all neurons either entering or exiting the spinal column at any segment. So when we think of the neurons that are entering or going towards the central nervous system, those are our sensory neurons, and we think of the neurons that are exiting the, the CNS and ultimately traveling to the targets, those that just that gets um, classified as the motor division, but then the motor division gets subclassified as the voluntary or the somatic system, which is going to control our skeletal muscle. 
and then the involuntary division which is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. If you look on my picture there, you see also right here, let me find my cursor, here we have the enteric, which is super interesting, but it's not something we're gonna focus on in our class, but this is something that's gaining a lot of traction. Um, some people are currently referring to the um, gut as being, or the gastrointestinal system as being the, the second brain, right? Because it's so incredibly innervated and there's so many neurotransmitters that pr are produced there. So that's something that we're not going to really get to do too much of in this class, but might spark your interest for further study at a later time. All right, so we're going to look here at the somatic and the somatic slash, vol slash voluntary. You may have learned um, either name and either is appropriate and the autonomic nervous system. So these are our outgoing, right? These are our efferent nerves, which exit the central nervous system and they travel to the target. The somatic system specifically is involving nerves that are going to control our skeletal muscles and they do that by voluntary action. So this is voluntary control of the skeletal muscle. The autonomic nervous system, which gets subdivided into the sympathetic and the parasympathetic, that's outside of conscious control. So that's involuntary control of our targets. And the targets of the autonomic nervous system specifically are going to be the respiratory system, the cardiovascular system, the digestive system, and the genitourinary systems. So that's kind of where we're going to look in terms of our ultimate action. And when we start to look at drugs, we're going to be looking at drugs that affect those systems, right? Or I should say, if we need a drug to affect those systems, then in many cases, an autonomic nervous system is going to be the thing that we're going to choose. And I should say, even if we're not trying to necessarily affect those systems, we're trying to do something else. Because the autonomic nervous system is so far reaching, a lot of the side effects that we have of medications are gonna be seen in those systems as well. Like for example, if you were using an autonomic nervous system drug to affect the cardiovascular system, chances are you'd see um, side effects, pardon me, in those other systems, the respiratory, the genitourinary, and the GI. Okay, so the primary actions of the autonomic nervous systems, or what I, we're going to be referring to most of the time as the targets. So the autonomic nervous system, both sympathetic and parasympathetic, are going to lead to um, contraction or dilation of smooth, or relaxation, I should say, contraction or relaxation of smooth muscle of hollow organs. So the smooth muscle of hollow organs is a target. And so anything that's hollow, so you can see I have some things on the list there. The airway, the bronchi are hollow. The blood vessels are hollow. The entire gastrointestinal system is hollow. All the organs found in the gastrointestinal system, the t in the, the gastrointestinal system proper, are hollow organs. The genitourinary organs are hollow. So the smooth muscle that wraps all those hollow organs are a target of the autonomic nervous system. The um, cardiac muscle is a target as well. Um, I should also put on that list the conduction tissue of the cardiac system as, is also a target. So the SA node and the AV node specifically, um, and our glands. So salivary glands, sweat glands, you know, the glands that produce mucus in both the respiratory tract and the GI system are all, all also targets of the autonomic nervous system. So again, the effectors, that's the word that we use, right? So it's the same list here. The somatic or voluntary system has one effector and one effector only, and it's always skeletal muscle and it's always voluntary. The autonomic nervous system being sympathetic and parasympathetic, the smooth muscle of hollow organs, cardiac muscle tissue, and glandular tissue. So the way the nervous system works is this is communication, right? So the most basic way and the simplest um, communication loop, if you will, is what we call the, re the reflex arc. And so this is the voluntary reflex arc. And so the players in a reflex arc have to be, right, this is, this is communication. So in this example, we have this finger being jabbed with a pin, which is going to stimulate receptors, pain receptors most likely, but they could be pressure receptors as well. You know, there's all kinds of receptors found in our skin. And that's going to then stimulate this neuron if it reaches threshold, it's gonna generate an action potential. As you know, action potentials are all or none phenomenon. So it's gonna carry that action potential all the way 
if this nerve is stimulated, this entire neuron is going to, to propagate this action potential. And so you can see it's entering in here through the dorsal root ganglia, entering into the dorsal horn of the spinal cord, right? So here we have our little horn, and which is gray matter, if you remember. And the option here would be to ascend to the brain if necessary, but in this case, it's a simple reflex arc. It doesn't have to. So instead, it's going to get that message is going to get decoded and processed and all of that integrated by this interneuron. And that's going to generate an outgoing signal, right? An outgoing message, which is going to exit the front part of the spinal cord. And it's going to leave and it's going to then travel. This is the voluntary system. So there's only one neuron that exits the central nervous system and it travels all the way to the target, which is always for the voluntary system, always skeletal muscle which is going to cause you to pull that finger away right this is out this is voluntary which means it's within conscious control and it's fast it's instantaneous and again with the outgoing message when we're looking at the nervous system and the organization we want to think about how many efferent neurons are there is there only one neuron if there's only one neuron and it's an efferent message leaving it's a motor signal leaving and it's leaving on one neuron that travels from the CNS, from the, that level of the spinal cord, all the way to, in this case, the finger, the muscle of the finger, that would be, if it's one neuron, um, that would be a, always a, a, a voluntary or somatic signal, right? So you can see the comparison here with the voluntary system. There's one efferent neuron always, one big long neuron. It leaves the spinal cord and it synapses at the neuromuscular junction there at the skeletal muscle. In contrast, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic, this is considered the involuntary system. This is the autonomic nervous system. And in both of those cases, there's always going to be two efferent neurons. You can see one here I'm outlining and you can see the second one here two efferent neurons. It doesn't matter if it's sympathetic or it's parasympathetic. There's subtle differences in terms of where those neurons exit and how long they are, but the key so far is just to know that there's two efferent neurons. That's the deal. So here's the setup of the autonomic nervous system. Like I just said, it's a two neuron system. Preganglionic is the first one before the ganglia, right? So you can see that here, preganglionic neuron number one. Here's the ganglia, the place where the nerves are coming together, where they meet. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And then here's the second neuron in the chain. We call that the postganglionic neuron. And then you see your target, right? This is the effector. So this is the deal, right? We need to know about the setup. We're going to also need to know what the names of these transmitters are here, right? This is, this is an electrical signal. So an electrical signal gets generated at the central nervous system and it propagates, gets propagated down this neuron. Then that electrical signal has to get converted into a chemical signal to bridge this gap. So we'll talk about that. Once that happens, that's going to potentially depolarize this neuron, which will generate an electrical signal in this postganglionic neuron all the way down. And then again, we need to convert that signal into a chemical signal to ultimately stimulate the effector or to, to, to affect the target, if you will. All right, so we've got two kinds of communication that we have to be aware of. The electrical, which you learn more about physio in physiology, and the chemical, which we're going to talk a lot more about come in the coming lectures. So here's just another view of it. Sensory, afferent, going towards the CNS, one big long neuron. Somatic or voluntary, leaving the CNS, outgoing, so it's efferent for exit, E for exit, outgoing message, synapsing only, in this case, only with what? Do you remember? Skeletal muscle, always. And then we've got the autonomic nervous system, which could be parasympathetic or sympathetic. We've got a preganglionic neuron and a postganglionic neuron. We call that um, the involuntary or the autonomic nervous system setup. And then the targets of the autonomic nervous system are numerous, smooth muscle of anything hollow, glandular tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, and also the, the conductive tissue of the heart. So that's where we are to start. That's the setup. Um, just really quickly, not super important, but just to mention the anatomy of the sympathetic neurons versus the parasympathetic. So in both cases, you're going to have two. It's a two-neuron system, preganglionic, postganglionic. The preganglionic neurons are going to exit the 
uh, spinal column in the sympathetic ner nervous system um, from the thoracic and the lumbar region of the spinal cord. And the preganglionic neurons tend to be very short. So you can see, see these bulges right on the either side of the spinal cord? Those bulges are the ganglia. Whoops, sorry. Those bulges are the ganglia. That's where the first neuron ends and the second neuron starts. So the sympathetic chain ganglia tend to run on either side of the spinal cord, which you may have witnessed when you took your anatomy class. You might have learned that there. So essentially what we're saying is the sympathetic nervous system has is composed of short preganglionic neurons exiting from the thoracic and the lumbar region and long postganglionic part of me that, that span then all the way to the target. The parasympathetic is the opposite, and we'll see that lots of time they oppose one another. The parasympathetic efferent um, neurons exit from the top and the bottom of the spinal column, so from the cranial and the or the cervical and the um, sacral region of the spinal cord. The preganglionics are really long. They go almost all the way to the target, and the postganglionics are very short. All right, so the ganglia for the parasympathetic nervous system is right on or very close to the effector. Here's another picture of our sympathetic ganglia on either side of the spinal column. And again, those bulges are, are just where bunches of nerves. So when we say nerves, a nerve is a bunch of neurons running together. So we have, you know, bands or bundles, if you all will, of neurons that end together and then the next group starts together. And so the ganglia is that collection of the ending of the preganglionic and the beginning of the postganglionic. All right, so we're gonna um, move into our responses after this video. So I'm gonna end this one, give you a minute to kind of catch up and um, regroup and then the next video will will pick up here and it will start to look at the the general sympathetic and parasympathetic responses